Hello, everyone, and welcome to Adobe Live. I hope you all are doing well today. My name is Anna McNaught, and I will be the host today. And today I am joined by Ryan Schutte. Welcome, Ryan. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Good. I'm so excited to have you here. Your work is really cool. I have been doing a little stalking of your portfolio and your Instagram, and I'm I'm just blown away by what you do. So I'm sure our audience is going to be super excited as well. I appreciate it. Yeah, looking forward to jumping in. Yeah. Um, just want to give everyone a warm welcome in the chat. Hey, Steve and Oliver and Annika and Marsha. Nice to see you all here with us today. Um, just a quick reminder to everyone. Um, don't forget to subscribe over on our new Adobe live channel on YouTube to stay up to date with the latest streams and participate in the Adobe live community and so much more. We always have a lot of fun on these streams, so you'll definitely want to subscribe to be up to date on anything new that we have going on. So without further ado, Ryan, I would love for you to give our audience a little intro and uh, show off your beautiful website. Yeah, so uh, and uh, a lot of action and it's just the stage narrative uh, thing I've gotten into and really is the main focus of my work. Um, you know, I also do portraits and simpler setups that are created like this but with less people but uh, the main thing that I get hired to do and the main thing I do for my personal fine artwork on the side are kind of these larger scenes so uh, I brought this one up as a starting point since it was the cover of my book and it's kind of the mm -hmm. most widely known image uh, but you know this is way back in 2012 and actually it was a collaboration with Lauren Randolph. Um, and since then, you know, I, I've collaborated with a bunch of different photographers to make these types of images, but I still kind of keep going back, doing them on my own and uh, yeah, get lots of questions about how they're made. So I'm gonna try and do a rough, quick version of this for you today. So cool. Yeah. I mean, there's so much that clearly goes into these pieces and I've seen a lot of these um, kind of images in the advertising world. So I'm excited to learn from you. Right on. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, you know, there's any part of this process. Again, I just want to tell everyone while we're going through it, um, depending on everyone's experience with doing these composites, uh, definitely stop me along the way, but it's, it's a pretty simple thing once we get into it. So hopefully uh, people will be encouraged to take their own crack at it. Cool. Um, I guess I can go through a few more images to kind of... This one is a more recent one that was inspired by uh, Patti Smith book in her memoir she talks about getting on a bus and going to new york for the first time so i kind of recreated mm. that moment where she decides to get on and uh this you know pretty much could have been one image so even though we did composite almost a different frame for most people because there's overlap in the subjects i try not to cut people out so i'll grab as many that from the same frame as possible um, because the ones where there's more separation, I can just easily blend with their natural background. And I find that cutting people out around their heads, especially with hair, uh, always kind of gives it away. And so I try not to do that as much as possible. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, Marsha actually just said, I love your girl on the stairs with the green apple. I have so many questions. <laughs> oh, really? That's funny. That's it. Was that on that page? I haven't uh, looked at that image in a long time. I don't know um, if she saw it somewhere else, but no, yeah, it's here somewhere. Um, but what questions do you have? I'm, I'm happy to jump into that one. Um, yeah, Marsha, let us know what questions you have. Um, and maybe maybe we could jump into Photoshop for now. And then, Marsha, if you have any questions specifically on that piece, we could go back to it later on. Cool. I'll get rid of that. So here is uh, a much less flashy version of that same approach. 
uh, using all natural light just for the sake of it um, and using a real family instead of actors for the subjects. So, you know, the it's been the whole range of uh, people I've cast uh, through casting websites to paid actors for commercial gigs, but uh, I'll always go back to using real subjects for the same thing if I can. And families have become their own separate theme within this series. Uh, and there's just something fun and spontaneous about doing this with uh, real people uh, and seeing what kind of reactions you get. And so typically what I'll do is once I get set up and, you know, if I'm lighting it, there's a large amount of time spent doing that. But in this instance, it was more about setting up props everywhere and kind of finding the right angle. So then we'll get everyone in there and just kind of shoot for half hour, an hour, and maybe, you know, go in and direct everyone a little bit, mm. but then let them play around and try and see what happens you know i'll give them specific direction but then also kind of let them play and have fun with it um so my background plate for this one is going to be this guy right here let me just get back into photoshop there we go um just because this is a random kind of in-between moment we played with him kicking the ball into the net a bunch of times and it worked fine but there's something i loved about whatever he's doing here uh, <laughs> that felt like a good kind of heroic yet confusing moment to lead with because you know these things can also get very obvious with the story you're trying to tell and so sometimes I'd like to throw in a little bit of ambiguity in there so yeah he, he's going to be the background and then we're going to so what I've done is already gone through and selected all the frames and dropped them into here so we don't have to go through that process because that is quite tedious and takes a while to pick the best frames from everyone's action. Um, but here I have a different one for each person in the shot and they're all turned off for now, but I'm going to turn on my second one, which is this girl here with the dog. And <laughs> typically these would blend super naturally and um, without even having to adjust where the background lies. But because I was using uh, a ladder for a tripod uh, to get high enough up because the ground sloped uh, very significantly towards the back of the yard. Uh, obviously a ladder's not as sturdy and so the camera's moving around a bit. Um, so I'll have to go in and line this one up so that it does blend. So the best way I found to do that is to go in your blend modes and change it to difference. As you can see, let me go back just so you can see where we started. So normal, is up here and this is your blend mode so we go to difference and then you can see where the white lines are is where it's not matching oh. so um we want to go to our arrow tool here so we can move the image around and then try and make it just line up and when it lines up uh the white lines disappear so not only is this off uh vertically but it's also tilted a little bit so i'll zoom back out and i'll uh do uh transform here so i can rotate it a bit and this can get yeah a little tedious but i'll just get it close ish for now so we can get through the process but you can see as i tilt it they kind of line up or not, and then move it like there. You know, and the other thing you want to think about when you're doing this is keeping all your settings the same and trying not to change the focus because if you refocus in the middle of one of these shoots, you're changing the shape of all mm. the objects in the shot, and that's going to make it really hard to line up later. So you'll not only have to change the size of uh each frame to line up but then the tilt and it gets really confusing on which parts you've changed so this looks fairly close-ish there because right now we're only worried about the background behind her matching 
we don't have to worry this as you can see over to the left here is a little bit more off but because that's not going to be part of the the final frame it doesn't matter so as long as the parts we see behind her are closer and you can use your arrow key as well for more fine-tuned movement of the frame mm -hmm. instead of using the mouse because sometimes that moves it too far yeah, that's so. a really good tip to use uh, the blending mode to kind of see where you're working here, because sometimes I'll use opacity, but I like that you can um, see here if you're getting rid of those white lines. And yeah. uh, Sean also offered the tip of uh, edit align layers. I know sometimes Ooh. that works, sometimes it doesn't. Depends can we on... try it? Yeah. All right. Uh, how come I don't... Where do I see that? Um, oh, it's because I'm in the middle of a free transform. Let me... Center there. Uh, I always love new tips. It's like I've been doing it the other way for so many years, and I'm sure there's a better way, but oh, auto, yeah, I see. auto align layers, but it's not. Maybe you need to have two selected. Both of them. Yeah. yeah. Let's try that. All right. Okay, so the dialog box came down up here. Here we go. We'll just do auto and see what happens. Did it work? Yeah, so it's much oh. more seamless. There's Thanks a, for the tip, Sean. That's such a good one. <laughs> yeah, you can see now as I turn it on and off, nothing moves, so perfect. I will be doing that from now on. It's yeah. funny that <laughs> I've been doing this for so long and in like a, a much more difficult way. I know there's always new things being introduced uh, yes. in Photoshop, especially now with sky replacement and uh, subjects uh, aware where they can go around the hair and you don't have to clip people out uh, using yes. a pen tool anymore, which is like, it's going to save a whole lot of headache. Um, I know. So once it's lined up, I will go and then erase away the layer by making a layer mask. Um, new adjustment per, here we go, layer mask, and I'll hide all. So now she's gone, and then I'll go to my brush tool, which um, I'll put to the 0% hardness, and then I kind of know where she was and you see the mask over here is all black so you want your tool to be white and then make sure it's highlighted and then you'll just paint her back in so um jacal asked if you offer any online classes uh no in fact this is the first kind of tutorial I've done like this so oh wow um I I should look into it though because I'd be happy to although I've always kind of felt that people did it uh faster and had better ways as, as we've already discovered uh yeah. so it didn't occur to me that my kind of old school slow painstaking way would be <laughs> helpful for people but I would be happy to do that if there was interest yeah, that would be cool, especially with these big commercial shoots that you do and like all the um, extensive compositing. I think there isn't a lot of uh, tutorials on that out there. I know yeah. the only one I can think of. Do you know Josh Rossi, who does some Marvel stuff kind of like this? No, Marvel, like the yeah. posters. Yeah, uh, oh. I don't. I don't know if he um, specifically works for them, but he kind of does the same sort of style as you with a ton of people composited into one mm. shot. Um, and he teaches a little bit, but um, yeah, I think you should definitely do tutorials. That would be cool. Yeah, um, that would be, and I, you know, it's always fun finding communities like this that um, we can help each other out. And, you know, I'm part of a lot of different photo groups that I get tips from people and, you know, share with them, you know, cause a lot of people don't want to undertake a, a shot on this scale cause they just feel intimidated. And once they see how simple the process is, maybe they think otherwise. So I think it's great to kind of bounce ideas back with the community, but absolutely. the reason I had done, and I don't know um, how familiar everyone is with layer mask, but 
once I've done like a rough, uh, I got her in like for the most part, uh, I'll go back and option click the mask and you can see, you make sure there's just no spare bits you miss. So if there was, if the mask wasn't complete in the middle, you don't want any ghosting from the background image. This should all be white uh, where it is uh, removed. So uh, once that's there, then I can move on to the next layer. So, so that was girl with dog in front and then girl with dog in back. So we're gonna replace her with a different frame, even though this is kind of nice. I may go back to that, which would be nice to have later, but I also liked her here. Um, and this one we won't need to align because you can, as you can see, she is gonna kind of overlap with our subject here. And I wanna move her to this area here. So this is kind of an interesting challenge that would take me a bit longer maybe than we wanna complete here, but I can just get it started at least. So um, I'll, I would just go and kind of select a rough area for her. I know I'm only going to take this much of, I'll probably end up cutting her out fully to do this uh, seamlessly, but let's just start here and then I'll just command click on the selection I've made and move her to right there. And then I could pretty much at this point, let's deselect it, get rid of the rest of her frame. So go back to where I deselected it and then hit uh, shift command I uh, to select the rest of the frame and delete it so we don't see it anymore. And now we have her over here. How do we line her up with this new background? The leaf pile obviously is going to have to change because she has this dog or in the frame behind her, she's going to be on top of herself. So we need to find a clean plate with this leaf pile uh, empty. So we'll do that later. But for now, let's just get her close. And then we will add. Uh, and let's see if now that we have this edit auto align, I guess it wouldn't work if I've moved a chunk of it. So I think I'm gonna have to go back to kind of that old school way of just cutting around her and blending her as clean as I can with this background. Mm -hmm. So now that she's, I'm kind of just lining her up with the siding right here, because that's going to be the only thing that's the giveaway of that we've moved her. Um, and then let's do, this is a rough way to get an imperfect, but at least a fast selection on her. I suppose I could do that uh, select subject, but I just haven't played with it enough to do it right now. So. Yeah, you should be able to do select subject. It will probably and it will do it just in this well. frame. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it for whatever layer you're on. Oh, okay, it's such it... a game changer. Although the magnetic lasso is such a great tool too. That's always what I used instead of pen tool throughout the years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because you know, even with the pen tool, there's going to be some imperfections, and you're going to have to clean up the mask anyway. So. To me, it only makes sense to get a rough and then go in later. But so now that I've got her selected, let's do another layer mask and get rid of everything else behind her. We want to reveal the selections. So there she is. And we can, uh, I'll, whatever tool I'm on, I'll usually go command and get to the move tool fairly quickly. But so she's, she looks a lot smaller here, even though she was only about a foot behind where she's sitting in this leaf pile. It's interesting how much smaller she looks. So I may also just um, make her, well, let's leave her that size for now, actually. Because who knows, once we get rid of the clone of her behind her, how much we'll see that. But as you can see, yeah, the this gives me concern seeing this hard edge, obviously I can mm -hmm. finesse it and blend it a little bit later, but already if this isn't going to blend super nice and it's going to look obvious that she's cut out, I'm going to just revert to having her from this frame because to me, I, it's not worth having a different frame that I like more if it's even getting give any hints that there's a composite because 
I just don't want these images to look like that. Um, but within that, you can do a really rough little cleanup to start how I would get it closer. So let's keep, there we go. So, and another, <laughs> this is a good image to use of what not to do for a lot of reasons mm -hmm. for the shot. Um, and that's mostly in the way that it's shot. Obviously I'm at like 200% or something or 300%. So it's going to look bad anyways, but you know, this was used using an old Canon 5 DSR, which I love for these shots because it's a big 50 megapixel sensor. Um, and then you may say, well, why not just use medium format? Uh, and the problem with that is your depth of field is so shallow with medium format that to get most of the subjects roughly in focus, you need to be shooting at like F22. And mm. that's just not, uh, you know, especially with strobes um, and, and at dusk, I like to shoot a lot at, which this is, you're not gonna have enough light to freeze the subjects and to get F22. Yeah. So I stick with 35 millimeter for the reason that you just have so much more depth of field. And I can usually shoot around you know, five F five six and get people mostly close uh, to in focus. You know, I really I just need the main subject in focus. The background should go a little bit out, but I don't want everyone to be you know like super blurry. Um, so even just going in with a little soft brush, this is looking a little bit better. Um, and then typically at the end, I will add a bunch of grain. Uh, to it to kind of increase how that overlap looks. It kind of like helps hide it a little bit more. Um, but back to, yeah, the, just the quality of light in this open shade doesn't really lend itself to kind of the crisp nature of a lot of the other shots you'll see on my website. Yeah, and so do you, are you usually shooting um, with strobe for most of your setups that you have on your website? Yeah, I'd say about 90% okay. of them have strobe. And then um, are are your subjects always in the scene that you're compositing into, or are you sometimes shooting them separately in a studio and then putting them in place? No, that's a great question. Like to your friend's Marvel example, um, those posters always... <laughs> I've met with, there's an agency in LA called BLT that does those. And, um, you know, they're not doing anything in camera. They're cutting it all out from shooting people on seamless because that's just to do with celebrity talent. Yeah. Um, I don't enjoy that process at all. And I've never explored doing it because it always does look fake to me. And I want these to feel organic and natural as much as possible because the actions are all already so fantastic that I don't want to have any illusion to Photoshop being the driving force behind the image creation. I want it to be about the story. So I never shoot, I never put anything in the frame that wasn't there when we were there. Everything is shot mm -hmm. and lit and directed at the same time. There's a few rare occasions where there might be like a plane in the sky or something really small or unnoticeable to most people, but um, I'm just not shooting subjects for sure uh, in a different place. And I'm not, I'm not lighting them individually and then pulling the lights out of frame. I'm always having the lights on the edges of the frame and uh, just l using that constraint again to make all the lighting match up because I find once you do just start dragging lights around and lighting everything separately, it, it again, it's going to make it look more fake and I'm right. really trying to avoid that. Um, so I'll move down to this leaf pile to try and find her better background. And I know it's the next frame here. So let's do uh, auto align with all these frames, I suppose. And let's see if it works when I've grabbed all these. I'm a little bit nervous, but it's, it's a fun experiment. Yeah. All right, so if, yeah, looks totally nice. clean. Nice. Love that. That's just saved me hours of my life. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I know, I've got to, 
got to always thank Sean on here for all the little quick tips. <laughs> yeah, Sean, uh, send me your address. I, I want to send him a gift to thank you for that. <laughs> it's seriously many, many hours. And it's such a simple, like, why didn't I just look that up at some point? It's stupid that I would just, to me, it's easier to do it the way I know how than totally. always try and find a new way, but that's huge. Yeah, so, I am, I'm right there with you. <laughs> so now that uh, we have, he's going to be, uh, actually his uh, frame is this guy with the fire, but then he also happens to have a nice clean leaf pile plate here. So I'm just going to go in and initially do the same layer mask. I'll hide everything, but then bring back the bits from this layer that I want. So... Once the, the background layers are lined up perfectly, you can see how easily it is. You don't have to cut anyone out. You just very easily use a brush and blend in the layers and it's pretty seamless. Um, again, and th that's why a lot of these are intentionally shot with having people not overlapping each other because it gives me the freedom in post to very easily blend these layers and, and keep it making look real instead of I just don't want to cut them all out. So here you can see, even though I have a clean plate for here, I'm going to have to go around her legs because it uh, has a little bit of an overlap. Let's get rid of the dog from that one. And then of course, I'm shooting over the course of an hour at dusk. So the light is changing fairly mm -hmm. drastically. So depending on how, I'll, I'll usually try and make selections consciously with the subjects closest to the same time frame for that reason. So I don't have too much of a shift in the light, but you can see like his frame was a little bit earlier. So this plate was a little bit warmer. I'll have to just slightly go in and match them all up to the same color temperature before I do my final color. But let's go in now and then re bring in or erase the parts of the frames that are overlapping her. So this will get a bit trickier because I'll have to go, I'll still have to go around just her legs where she's peeking out behind herself eventually. But we'll just get a rough in there for now so we don't play with it too much. And then I'm just switching between the black and the white brushes uh, using X to kind of quickly do that. And I'm sure... <laughs> There's a, a faster way for all this, but again, this is the way it kind of generally works. So I'm just gonna stick with that for now. Yeah. And you can see some of the dog's ear is gonna overlap her leg here. So I'll just go in and clone that out eventually. But for now, just to kind of get an idea of where we stand with all our subjects so far, um, after each one, it's nice to kind of zoom out and be like, okay, you don't really know how they're gonna live in relation to each other until you start doing it and so it's good to kind of check in with the overall image and make sure the story still making sense the way you thought it would when you were making your selects mm. so here i know remember there was a car in his frame but um i guess i didn't bring it in so i was consciously thinking oh, i'm gonna have to find a clean plate without a car here but it, i just don't Luckily, the smoke from this fire plate, you can see, is roughly the same smoke. So that shouldn't be too much of a difficulty to blend it. I guess we're getting a little bit of a car here. So let's just take that out. I wish that barrel wasn't there, but maybe that's another thing I'll go in at the end and remove. So, you know, you, you asked about bringing things in. Uh, and again, that's something I typically don't try and do, but I will uh, clone things out a lot. And so that's why it's always important as well when you're done to try and get a clean plate of the whole frame and remove as many props as you can because uh, you don't know what you want to keep while you're shooting. You're kind of focusing on the subjects. Uh, hopefully you've done as much set design in, in beforehand as possible, uh, but a lot of times the, the day gets really busy and you don't have time to sit and contemplate it like you do as you're doing the post. So right. they're just things you didn't see like, oh, I, I'd rather this basket not be here. And so uh, 
this all just got really busy. I wish I had a clean plate of all this stuff removed and then I would just erase it away. But uh, unfortunately, sometimes that's not the case. Like with these barrels, <laughs> they're full of water. So I wasn't able to move them because they're like uh, reservoirs for the gutter strip system they have going here. Um, but if you can, yeah, always do as much in camera as possible. It's going to save you a lot of time in post, but more importantly, it's just going to look more real when you're not uh, fabricating a lot of things. Like it would have been easier to, well, I don't know if it would have been easier, but I just prefer for my own sake to do everything practical. So like I could have re replaced this light bulb but instead I'm going to clone this light and put it over here. So they both mm. look turned on. Um, but again, that's something, did you notice it while you were there? Did you have enough time and help? This one I did all by myself. Obviously if it's a paid gig, I'm going to have a huge team to help me see all these things that I'm not seeing uh, in right. camera. So let's turn on our next. So this one was shot way earlier. You can see it's much brighter and I think the overall scene will end up going a little bit closer to this, not quite this bright, but uh, just so we can see what's going on for now before I have to make that decision, I will get her exposure somewhat closer um, by doing an adjustment layer that's attached only to this um, uh, file here. So you see, if I just do a curves layer, it will go on top and affect everything the way this curves layer is. But this one, I want only to affect uh, the cabinet frame. So I'm going to say use previous layer to create clipping mask and then hit OK. You can see the layer goes and it has an arrow where it shows that it's pointed just at this layer. So I'm going to bring it down and then Let's group these. So if you select both of them and you hit Command G, you have a group. Now we'll rename it Cabinet. We can turn it off and on and see how close that exposure is to the other one. And then let's also realign it because it looks like the camera moved very significantly from the last one. So let's try our auto align again. I wonder if it'll work. It might not work with a group. Am I seeing it here? Oh yeah. All right. Did it work? Yeah, it's got a little bit of a bump and mm. I wonder if that's because I had that. Um, that curves layer in there or what? If, if it's because I made it a group. Either way, um, I can go and kind of check it with that initial way I did the first one. And it got it at least a lot closer than I would have. Yeah, so you can see. It's really cool. I think what that's doing is not only positioning it, but it might be transforming the layer as well because this lined up so well. I'm kind of skeptical at how well it lined up just by that little tweak. And I'm guessing that's what auto align is doing is, mm. is, is kind of morphing the shape of the file or the, that uh, frame to fit. So that looks great. I'll go back to normal blend mode. And now let's, I have a shortcut for that adjustment or uh, layer mask, which would be, uh, I want to hide it. So shift command H, now she's gone. And let's paint her back in. I'm curious where you get your inspiration from for um, many of these pieces. I know a lot of them are client-based, but when you're doing personal work, what kind of is your starting point? So with all the, um, there's like a main section on my website, which shows kind of the darker, uh, more dramatic and theatrical mm -hmm. tableaus. 
uh, this this series with families is very much based on real families. So it's usually I ask them where they want to shoot. Is it their house? Uh, is it a park they want to go to or a restaurant they hang out at? So we'll have a whole discussion to make it kind of more documentary based that way. Oh, cool. But with the the all the images that I initially got started with this on, they're all inspired by the locations themselves. So I would just be driving around L.A. And it's such a cool town for seeing very interesting locations that um, I would kind of bookmark a place. And I'm always going around shooting street photos and scouting and riding my bike and looking for new places to shoot these types of scenes. So it really starts with the location. Um, and then once I've decided on the location, I'll kind of get a rough angle of what I think are the elements within that location that I want to include. Mm. So if it's at a school, it's like, okay, which part of the school am I showing? How much of the street or the houses behind the school? Um, and then I'll kind of have a crop in mind already and a specific angle. And then I'll say, okay, what makes sense to go in this location? How many people do I need to fill it? Uh, what are they doing? And as much as possible, those decisions should be based off of what feels natural for that location. So it's kind of working backwards from the location and then hopefully landing up in a narrative that feels somewhat normal for the location. But then obviously the people's actions are almost always heightened a bit to make it more interesting or fun to me. But we'll also, as we're shooting, you know, go through the rounds of something very banal, like them just standing there, you know, I want options so that I can kind of create the narrative in post as well. If everyone has both, both like a super theatrical version of what they're doing and then a very plain kind of, I'm just walking down the street version, mm, then I can make those choices later and say, okay, <laughs> you know, this got too crazy. Everyone's doing something wild and I got to tone it down. And so I'll go back and find actions from that person. Like, you know, this, the mother in the cabinet, uh, she, there's plenty of her, you know, she's like watering, she's doing this, she's yelling at the dog. And, you know, we already have so much going on with these two that I didn't need her to add to that kind of mayhem in the middle of the frame here. So just her getting something out of the cabinet is where I landed with that. Cool. Yeah. Really interesting to hear your thought process behind that. Yeah. It's, uh, and it, it hasn't, stray too far from that. I mean, sometimes it will work in reverse where I'll have a concept and I'll need to find a location to fit that concept. So um, it's more rare that that happens. That's usually mm -hmm. the way it works for commercials because they have come up with an idea before even hiring me and I'm just there to carry out their idea. So it's gotcha. a totally backwards way of working, um, but it's, it's really the same. They're just you start from either end, but they kind of end up in the same middle ground. Cool. And in places where you can't really um, control the environment as much, like, for example, I was just checking out your Tom's Coney Island one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Looks like it was set up for Motorola. So are they shutting everything down so that you can get these clean shots? Or are you just shooting and then editing the riffraff out? <laughs> no, yeah, that one uh, was crazy because we had to shoot it on the phone and do it in one frame, which is... Uh, <laughs> you know, quite a different process. There's no, oh they, they wouldn't allow compositing. It was part of like the legal ramifications for being able to say, we shot this on a phone. You can shoot it on a phone too. So wow. only, only editing that you could do on the phone and you couldn't do composites on the phone, but it's, it's very time consuming and annoying. And I, I haven't done it, but yeah. they tell me you can do it. I wouldn't dare try, but so, uh, that one, we had to rent out the whole location. Um, you know, we had as much access into Coney Island as we wanted, but that was kind of where we landed for the bulk of the stories we wanted to tell. You know, it's, we're kind of making decisions on how much we want to see into the rides themselves. And uh, the boardwalk just became kind of a cleaner landscape for mm. placing subjects. So okay, we, we didn't actually shoot inside the park for that reason. You can still see the rides in the background, but all the main actions happening in the foreground for that particular shot. And um, it was very crazy to do because 
again, I can't sync strobes with that either. Um, right. So I have to use constant lighting and uh, which is fine. You have a good film crew who does that for movies anyways. If you can afford them, that's a great way to go. But you're not getting the same f-stop you would get um, typically with strobes using constant lighting. And I mean, the, the other thing with the phone is that it's locked at like a 1.8 aperture. So we didn't need as much light anyways. Um, but you do have now the problem of your limited shutter speed to be able to freeze all the action. So that one was a much more kind of still moment where there's not as much movement going on because we're shooting at about a 30th of a second at dusk. And I'm, I'm literally triggering the phone by tapping it with my finger, <laughs> which is wow. just, again, oh crazy because you can move the phone, you can have camera shake, uh, the person in, in the foreground can move. There's all these variables of why that shouldn't have worked, uh, but very thankfully it did. Uh, yeah. and, and also a rare occasion, we had two days to shoot it instead of just one. So you have a whole pre-light day where while you're blocking everyone, uh, you get to test out all the problems that may happen. And we pretty much got it the first day, but because we had the second day, um, we were able to kind of fine tune all the lighting and, and redo it again the second day. Really incredible. It's so cool. Thank you for sharing all that. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because each one of those has their own story about how they how they happened and all the pitfalls that occurs along the way, because there's so much going on. Inevitably, there's going to be problems you come across that you didn't foresee. Um, totally. And I was about to replace this guy over here. I'm kind of liking this frame now that I see it, but because uh, you know, we can always keep it later. And I went through the effort to bring in a different frame for him. Let's just see, maybe we can get a vote uh, of whether we like this frame better <laughs> or the dunk, the missed dunk. Ooh, I love the yeah. dunk, but yeah. let us let us know in the chat what you all like, whether he's running up or dunking it. I think the dunk is just too good. Yeah. Like that's yeah. the mayhem right there. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And I guess that was the point, probably what I was thinking again, when I made this one, I was like, this looks more like a more believable scenario yeah. that I had caught this while, uh, and let me just, I'll select him away really quickly. So um, we can see what it would look like. And let's reveal selection. Did that work? No, so I'm on the wrong layer. No oh, oh, because it revealed the whole thing. Never mind. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Hide selection. Uh, okay. Dunk. Yeah. Uh, everyone in the chat is saying dunk for sure. There we go. I like it. I like the input. Um, that's what's fun about doing these things with for a client as well or collaborating with other photographers is that you get out of your head, you know, uh, doing them by yourself for so long, you, you feel confident in a decision in the moment and you kind of just stick with that. But a lot of times you don't have perspective on it because it's just your head. So I love working with other people to give me input on those things and mm -hmm. all those decisions kind of help to make, you know, a better image in the end generally. But so, yeah, he's close. Um, I wanted to just see it again uh, once we backed up. So the idea was these two are kind of and every shoot has um, at least one, if not more. I try and keep it to one so that it doesn't become overwhelming for the viewer. But like what I've started calling is the fulcrum point for the image that is the kind of the action that's driving everyone else's action so that your eye goes to one place. So it could be either one of these two people and maybe I leave them both in because I kind of do like both of their actions. But if, if it starts to feel like too much, that's again when I'll, I'll go back and replace one of them with a more subtler action. Mm. Um, and that was my kind of thought with the dunk, but I guess it's not any less kind of implausible that he could be doing this shot at the same time that they're doing this as he is doing the dunk so let's just leave it for now um and i can kind of think about it but you know now we have a rough idea of where the frame lies 
uh, overall with all of our subjects in place. So generally from there, I should have probably brightened this up a bit more so we can see what we're doing. The reason it's kind of been so dark and understated in general is because I was holding the exposure for the sky. Normally I would offset that with strobes. Um, again, I'm trying something different here with how much I can get away with natural light because I, it does feel more normal and more lifestyle to me. Um, and that's just a different choice for this particular part of the series. Mm. But um, this is kind of the more the exposure that the subjects will end up with. And then the foreground, I think, will still come down closer to this just because um, I want the subjects to stand out more. So eventually I'll go in and kind of selectively paint in this exposure for each person, uh, especially the dunk, which got much darker. Um, and he can obviously, and it's a, it's a balance. Like he's only going to get 50% more of the exposure. He's going to get hundred percent of it. And so on down the line, the fire is going to get none of that added exposure because it's too bright now and so forth. But here's a rough idea of the, the scene. Now that we have the composite, um, typically what I do from here is start the cloning. Um, I want to do all the composite and cloning before I get into color generally because the way things blend after you have a bunch of color layers, uh, it shouldn't be different. You know, the way it's set up, you know, you can in the clone tool is like you set whether you want it to sample current layer, current and below or all layers. So in theory, if you choose all layers, the clone should grab from all those and, and make it seamless still. But I found that if it's grabbing from, and there's other layers around, uh, it just, it doesn't work quite as well. Uh, so I, I try and do that before anything after the composite. So for oh. example, here, this isn't gonna be a clone. This is gonna be me duplicating this part of this light. I'm just gonna copy it instead. And that's always kind of a choice, whether I'm cloning something or copying a part of a different frame. It really matter. It just depends on which thing that is. But I just, once I've selected it, you just hit Command J to duplicate it. And you can see the new layers over here. Call this door to light. And, you know, maybe I wanna, flip it horizontally so it doesn't look so much like that one. Let's see what that does. Um, is this the one that's gonna flip the whole frame, isn't it? I always forget there's two, uh, oh yeah, that's the one. For flipping it, yeah, transform. But, uh, yeah, one of them flips the whole frame and one just does the layer. So that there, just does the layer. Yeah. <laughs> Again, <laughs> another thing you'd think I'd remember after doing this for 20 years, but uh, it's funny because even though I, I've done this so many times, I, I don't do it every day for a living. Right. Uh, so I'm almost kind of I'm not relearning it every time. It's just kind of, I'm, I'm just slower than people than a professional retoucher who would do this every day. Yeah, it's it's funny how you can do it for so long and forget where certain things are. Yeah. Like yesterday, I forgot something that I use all the time just because I hadn't been in Photoshop for a couple of weeks. It's like, yeah, it leaves so quickly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, probably for our brain's sake, for good reason, because totally you it's can't have too that much. all. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's so many things. Yeah, exactly. But it does get frustrating, especially when, you know, in this case, people are watching uh, more people than I've ever had watched me retouch. But even if there's just someone else in the room and I'm trying to do something with them, uh, I get flustered. I'm like, I forget what I'm doing. I don't know. Yeah. It shouldn't make that much of a difference, but it really does. So I, I totally understand that completely. I'm, <laughs> I'm the same way. I think that's human nature. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I've, I've duplicated, I brought it over here and I've added the layer mask and now I'm going to just paint it back in. It should look somewhat realistic here. 
that's fine for now. We're just going to get a rough idea. Zoom back out, see where it is. It's a lot more glowy looking than that because the exposure of the siding here is so much darker than the siding over here, not just from the light, but from the ambient light of the sky, for some reason is hitting the house more here than over here. So that will need some fine tuning on exposure, but also let's just do like a 50% brush. So we're not erasing away all of it, but just some of it. And maybe that's even too much. Let's go to 20. Kind of get us closer. It's funny if I looked at a lot of my peers who do this type of work, it would probably be super helpful if we all kind of sat in the room with each other to see our different uh, processes. Cause um, there's just, so, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I mean, I think it sparked a lot of ideas in me about how to speed this up, how to do things more efficiently or cleaner. Yeah. Um, but I think that's fairly close for now. So we'll just be happy-ish with that. And again, we can see what we're doing. So I don't like looking at it so bright. I don't know how it, if it's helpful for everyone to see it like this versus like this, but on my monitor, this feels more natural. So. Yeah, I think that looks good. Okay. Um, Mike is wondering if you use a tripod. You said you were on a <laughs> ladder for this, right? Yeah. So I have, <laughs> I have like a 15 foot tripod because um, typically uh, for these scenes, I'm always going to be want to be higher than the subjects. It helps give separation with everyone more. Mm. Um, if you have, especially if you have a lot more people and you're stacking them from foreground to background. Here we have just a couple simple planes, but if they're on top of each other a lot more, the higher you are, which, in, you know, in the Coney Island shot, for example, I'm on a 35 foot tall scaffolding. Mm. Um, and so, but in this type of scene, I'll typically want to be around 10 to 15 feet tall. And so I have a big tripod for that. This, because I was in the Midwest traveling when I shot this, I'm not carrying all my gear with me, which is also why I didn't light it partially. Um, I just grabbed a ladder from their garage and had a very small travel tripod with me that I had rigged, uh, you know, kind of zip tied to the ladder. So, right. so it's a very imperfect solution, but it gets you close enough. And I would definitely recommend always being on a tripod for these. I have done it before very early on. Uh, where I wasn't and you know you can get away with it because especially with that beautiful auto align tool we just learned about uh, you know you can kind of morph the shape of things to fit so that it'll, the backgrounds will line up but you're wasting a lot of time if you're on the tripod and they automatically line up uh, it's much easier to blend the subjects from different frames um, One, yeah 100 percent I mean, another good thing, way to think about that is if this is super wide angle, if you're really telephoto, the perspective of and shapes of all this objects in the frame don't change that much. So you can get a lot, you can get away with a lot more compositing from a super telephoto image um, than you can with a wide angle. Even though I have a friend who will go into a grocery store, for example, and shoot at 40 millimeters all different plates of uh, a very small scene and he'll create an artificially wide image because he wants that resolution oh. and so he'll use the auto merge feature to blend like let's say 10 different uh plates to build one background oh, and to me that sounds like a nightmare and something i would never do but yeah it proves that uh, you know, with Photoshop, you can easily do that if you want to go about it that way. Um, <laughs> I don't think the benefit of the resolution is, outweighs uh, having to deal with, you know, what if it doesn't line up or tweaking all the perspectives so that you can have that super high res photo, but uh, that's just his process. So, uh, you know, everyone's got their own way of doing things. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. 
So since I know most of the things I'm going to want to take out are on this background layer, I'm going to duplicate it because I don't want to uh, destroy the original background layer I have. But for things like this vent, I don't want to see it at all. And I'll go in. Usually I'll use healing brush, but depending on the background, this one I know is going to be super easy with the patch tool because, well, let's see. I may have just shot myself in the foot, but <laughs> um, usually for like a light switch or something that has an even background patch works typically really good. And it's just... Um, quick oh see it's not gonna because you can see the lines already aren't matching up let's see no so that's gonna be a little bit more lengthier if you have too many horizontal lines um because that's another actually a good point to make about perspective because i'm not square on with all these lines each one down is going to be a slightly different distance even though in reality uh, yeah. Yeah, the reality is these are all the same distance apart, but because I'm not perfectly square on them, that's just not going to work. So I'll have to go in and clone this out in the old school way. And I'm sure people are familiar with this tool plenty that they don't need to see me do this uh, in its entirety, but let me just get a rough so we can see. Usually I'll go and do a rough of most of the things and then fine tune them later anyway. So a lot of times it's easy to start with clone to get the thing kind of close and then healing brush from there. But again, I'm love to hear if anyone has a quicker way to do this than I've just done it. Yeah, I think um, if you do like content aware fill, that could be a good way or also... Ah. Um, maybe with the patch tool, rather than grabbing up or down, you're grabbing right or left. Right, right. So it's I know, still I was in worried. perspective. Yeah, I think I did have enough real estate over here. I think initially I was thinking I, I wouldn't, but that's a good point, which is another thing. Um, yeah, <laughs> seems so obvious now that you say it. I'm like, what? Of course, that's the way I would have done this. Isn't but it this... so funny though? It's like when you're yeah. live streaming or you're just doing it on your own, I, I always do the exact same thing. And you have an amazing amount of more experience than I do uh, based on the work I've seen of yours. So it's, can oh, I always thanks. have you, <laughs> can I always have you kind of just like retouching with me? And sure. Like... <laughs> um, no, I, I think I... I thought about that the other day. Like I could learn so much by, just paying a retoucher to watch me do something and then correct me on how I do it. Mm, so, that's a really good idea. Right. Are you, are you up for that? I'm, or? I'm up for it. <laughs> <laughs> I think because like, rather than like learn a bunch of things in a class or a tutorial that I don't need and right. Tutorials bug me for that. Like sitting through an hour tutorial just to find, I just need to figure out this one thing. Yeah, um, let me know. I'm totally down anytime. Because <laughs> typically, like, I'm doing the same types of things throughout all my images. So I, I'm not running across, like, a new thing I need to learn. And right. I just need a more efficient way to do the things that I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Maybe I'll have to start offering that as a yeah. service that I do because <laughs> I, I like that. And I think I'll have to have Sean and a few other people join me for it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, this whole thing got a lot busy. I don't know how much I'm going to do to clean that up. Maybe eventually take this white line out, but that's going to definitely not be something anyone wants to watch me try and do, fumble around. Um, mostly I'm just looking for bits and bobs that I want to take out this dish. I think it's in a super awkward placement in relation to this net. Um, so eventually maybe I want to clone it out and then move. I do like it because it feels like it belongs to this house, but maybe I just move it up here, which shouldn't look too fakey. I don't think, cause I don't know. I feel like once I do that, these lines aren't going to line up and I'm going to have to cut it out around its edges. And then it will look weird. And so maybe I'm just going to eventually take it out. 
but would you say that content aware fill is not going to work because of how close it is to this net? Um, you could try it. I mean, worst case, just command Z and um, yeah. sometimes I find that it works really, really well. All kind of depends on, um, All right, let's give it a whirl. Yeah. Cause it does bug me and I wonder what your thoughts are on leaving it in, in general. Yes, Annika uh, said, have we saved yet? Very good <laughs> reminder. <laughs> um, doesn't it auto save? That's a, that's a funny thing though. Let's save it. Um, so I'll go here and change to V1. There we go. Thank you, Anna. Or no, who was that you said? Uh, Annika. Annika. Thank yeah. you, Annika. All right, um, so now it's on this layer saying it's selected, content aware fill should just do that, huh? Yep, let's All see. Right. I rarely use this because I'm just, um, obviously I want to take away like all this. This is another one of those that, I mean, it's been around for what, probably eight years now. So it's not like that new, but it, it was after, I had already figured out how to do things without it. Uh, so I just got in the habit of not using it. Right. But um, the times that I do remember to use it, yeah, it's super helpful. Because yeah. even if it's rough, it's quicker than the things you have to fix about it usually are quicker than um, doing it from scratch. A hundred percent. Yeah. And then you can extend that preview area and it looks like it's already doing a pretty good job. Oh, wow. I didn't even. Yeah know that it shows you in real time. Yeah, so you don't want to get rid of too much around it. Just um, this, like, I found when you leave in, like, this white trim would be a problem, right? Sometimes. It depends. Sometimes uh, Sensei, like, knows not to include that. So Sensei, um, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you just extend that preview window, it's looking, I can't really see, but it looks pretty good. Looks like there's a little dark spot. Yeah. Yeah, but that would be easy to, that would, this would be a lot quicker start than if I would try and clone it, I think. So let's just, yeah, deselect it. Let's see. Yeah. And it makes its own layer. So, you know, you see the lines a little bit off, but they're, they're on on the left side, right? So let's turn it on and off and see. No, they're kind of it pushed it all down. That's yeah, close enough. Now, what I would normally do is, again, because trying to, well, I guess we could just try it, but normally I would just squash this into that other clone layer I have, but does that feel too destructive to people? Um, I don't know. I would do that as well. Because, yeah, okay, I don't good. like having the separate um, right. patch area that I worked on because then I'll clean it up. And, um, yeah, let's see, Mike, the shadow from the light that was removed. Yeah, so the shadow is still there. So um, Mike is offering the suggestion of possibly you could maybe use the patch tool um, and then slide to the right area there, like right above the goal net. And maybe that would cover the shadow and fix those lines. Oh, a quicker way than just doing this with the healing brush on every line? Yeah, yeah, because you could grab a big section, but always uh, easier said than when you actually mess with it. Sometimes, yeah. you know, <laughs> you start to do it and it doesn't quite work. I know, especially with lines, they get tricky, but let's try a patch. So... <laughs> It's a little bit embarrassing for me. I'm wondering how often do, do these sessions become I'm learning more than the viewers? <laughs> All the time. Oh, really? Yeah, I. it happens <laughs> often. So don't feel bad. I have okay. um, learned many things from streaming on here myself. Yesterday, uh, I did one and I was like, wait, I forget how to do this. And that's why <laughs> we have the wonderful chat always there to help us out. So thank you, chat. You all are the best. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty close. I think I still am going to need to go in and finesse the healing brush, but that did take a good chunk of it. 
Yeah. And then you could just touch that up. Yeah. Mike said there's 50 ways to do things. I usually pick the hardest way. I <laughs> totally agree with that. <laughs> That's what I'm finding out as well. I know it's, <laughs> I think because we learn Photoshop a certain way and then all these new things come about and easier and faster ways to do it, which is great and wonderful, but it's like teaching an old dog new tricks and yeah. you kind of, you have your method that works for you. And so it just, yeah. um, as Annika said a little while back, um, doing a little practice every day or just working on it when you can to kind of watch some short YouTube videos or reels and brush up on those new techniques that Photoshop and Adobe are always bringing to the table. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny, the everyday thing. I, I got almost like a visceral chill when I heard that. I, was like, <laughs> I know. If I had to do this every day, I don't know. I, <laughs> I know. Like when I have a client that is like, oh, no, we're going to take care of the retouching. I'm like, great. I don't want to do it. Um, I'm happy to. You know, it's funny because a lot of times they request it because of kind of all my quote unquote legacy images I've done yeah. myself. And so they say they want that look and I'm like, you're probably better off just hiring someone who can copy that look because uh, mm. they're probably going to mimic me better than I am going to mimic me, you know, like, right. Uh, right. Sometimes I, it's, it's not even a matter of the retouching. It's it, so much has to do with what you've captured in camera that the look was created when we're lighting it and by the people you pick and uh you know their wardrobe and the props and all these other elements that aren't the retouching i and totally agree it's funny when you know you get to the end of a shoot and a client's like yeah it doesn't have that same magic and i was like yeah well that's because you guys made all the choices with <laughs> <laughs> casting location wardrobe props like it wasn't yep. about the process at that point it was about like those specific you're looking at content you're not looking at like my Photoshop skills in that event. So right, you got to right. let me in more on those decisions early on if you want it to look like my other work. Yep. Yep. The client doesn't know what they want until they see it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was a good tip. That looks pretty close. And typically, you know, obviously if you go in at 200%, you can always find things. But like, I'll have a general rule of thumb where I think like, would the average viewer know that this was kind of looking smudgy because I did a bad cloning job or because that's the house, you know, like at some point you have to move on. Right. And right. so m making those choices is another thing to keep my sanity and keep me wanting to do this. It's like, if it, especially if it's an image, I know I'm not going to print six feet wide for a gallery, which that's when you really notice these things. If you're going to just put it on your website um, and it's going to be seen like this, then you know it's better often to move on to a new image and get more work done than butts with something that that's the other thing about my friend who goes in and makes those composites inside stores with you know 12 different plates because he wants to be able to read the the font on the packaging and i'm like when is anyone ever going to be able to see that you know like mm. choose your battles right like right so, what's more important here is it getting these details that no one's ever going to see or uh you know moving on to the next image or working on the color more there's just a million things you can do so you really have to prioritize where you spend your time totally so this is another thing that i want to visualize as we go along is that i have these curves up to see everyone but it's really bugging me to look at this sky that way because eventually i want it to be here so i'm just gonna mm erase away this curve this part of the curves layer here so we can see that oh, go to 100 percent and obviously right off the bat with this rough job it's going to look um probably a little too hdre um for me i'm going to want it to be much more kind of the same on top and bottom but this is just to visualize closer to where we may end up with the sky. So the way that the kind of branches go almost full black, I think we're going to work with that with all the blacks down here at some point. But 
Let's just get it somewhat closer. Okay. You know, and assuming, you know, without messing too much with more cloning stuff, because I think we have a general idea of what that looks like. And I don't want to spend too much time on all those details because like whatever this red thing is coming out of this uh, sandbox back, or uh, planner box back there is going to go. And I guess there's another thing to talk about, which is the perspective of the house. Um, mm. I had, you know, normally I would have shot this square on with the house so that all my lines were straight. But I liked the three dimensionality that's seeing that addition of the house kind of jutting at us. So I moved camera right of center. And obviously that takes all of our horizontal and vertical lines and puts them off kilter. And I, I typically want to see those somewhat straight, but that's another thing I won't do until the final is done. Cause if you don't like what you did, you're starting back from scratch if you've transformed the whole thing right going back and undoing uh you know let's say you want to switch a person out it's much more difficult if you've already changed the shape of the whole image so i would recommend not doing any of that until the end but just for the sake of expediting things here uh, maybe we want to move on to another image because i don't know how much more I would do to this before I shifted to color and perspective anyways. Mm. Um, I'll, now that I have my V1 saved, I can always go back to where I left off. So let's flatten this and we'll save it as V2 so we can just play with uh, the perspective really quick. So, and I'm want to make the background a layer so that you can adjust that. And then typically I'll start with distort and I'll bring some guides in from the rulers here and then command semicolon to show them. This looks close. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, this is a, it's pretty close as is. It was just something that was bugging me as we were looking at it. Also, I was planning on cropping probably the bulk of this shed to the side here off. So I didn't have to look at that, but let's just get this a little bit closer. I think not always, sometimes it looks too neat and forced that you've done this, but and it changes the shape of the subjects a little bit more than I'd like, but this is subtle. So to me, it's going to feel better in my mind that the lines are closer. Mm. I don't know. I'm curious what anyone else thinks about that, but you know, obviously if he's close to the edge, he's going to start getting squashed. So we'll kind of stretch it vertically as well to compensate for what I've done to the edges. And that's almost there. And you're just doing this uh, through transform, right? Yeah, so okay. edit, um, transform, and then distort, I found, is the best way that I can pull from all four corners. Mm. Um, you could use perspective or skew. I forget what the difference is with those, but I just remember they don't work <laughs> for me. So I always go to distort or... If you want to just bend something, and I really love the warp tool for the same thing, where like, let's say you have a curved line that's not straight, you can grab right. just one part of the frame and kind of bow it out, almost like liquefy, but for the whole, for a bigger part of the image than um, liquefy. So. Mm. so that's feeling much closer to where I would want it. Let's just leave it at that. Then move the guides away and then put a crop closer to what I'm thinking. This is the other reason why I want to use closer to like a 50 megapixels because 
like there was a whole bunch of grass on the bottom here um, that I didn't want, but it was either just fill it with sky uh, and tilt camera up because again, I wasn't, I would have, if I was taller, I could have made the lines more square shooting straight on the building. Uh, but because the ladder was only a certain height, I'm tilting the camera up to, and I didn't want to distort the line. So I left it kind of pointing as straight at the building as possible, but it left me a ton of grass in the foreground here. Um, so I've just cropped that out and obviously we're just losing, like by the time I do this crop, we're probably closer to, you know, like a 40 megapixel image, but that's not going to be too big of a deal. And again, even if we wanted to print it six feet wide, there's this resolution would hold up fine. So this is feeling a little bit better. I think the biggest thing with this image, which is, there's not so much I can do to it now. Um, I, I think a professional colorist may, but with a personal project, I'm not going to pay someone to do that. And for this particular one, I don't know that it's worth it. I, it probably isn't going to end up in my portfolio anyways, but I don't really love how the dusk light made everything so cyan. And of course, mm. We can warm it up and I'll usually use uh, just like a warming filter for that, but it's never going to get kind of the color I would, I'm used to seeing when I kind of have overall strobe fill, which is that clean kind of even light, or a lot of times I'm adding gels to the strobes to warm them up even more. So I like the mood that the the dusk is with this kind of blue tone, but it just feels like overall kind of mushy. And yeah. even even with this warming filter, and then I would probably go in and add like uh, another curves bump to give us that contrast. It doesn't quite excite me like a lot of the other images right out of the camera. You know, we also started shooting this when there was a little bit of direct light in the house. And so it, it was a lot closer to those colors that I liked. Um, but by the time we got everyone in place and, you know, directed them well enough to get the actions that I liked, it was much closer to almost uh, full open shade. I mean, it was full open shade. So yeah, uh, it's just, you know, it, it's its own vibe. It's just not, I think it's possibly too far a stretch from where I'm normally landing, but just to show you what I would do, um, my kind of color routine is I'll use a curves layer for contrast. Uh, typically a photo filter, this is my warming filter and I'm almost always warming up certain aspects, if not all of it. But right now it's just on the whole thing. And then selective color, I'm typically going in and, and messing with the blacks. This one's gonna be hard to see through the screen, but um, if I go, if I take a lot of cyan out of it, I kind of like this vintage vibe that add, it adds red to the shadows. Um, and this already has kind of this old school Americana vibe that's going on. So mm. that's interesting to me. And then I'll kind of enhance that by adding some magenta to them, which also adds a little bit of contrast. And then sometimes I'll, even add some blue by taking away the yellow and the shadows. And that's still kind of, it doesn't work as well with this particular image, but this is a typical color scheme that I would use um, if I started off with a more neutral color tone. So, but everything just feels super cyan. So let's, let's go in and let's just, go crazy with the warmth and see if that's making me feel any better. You know, especially right here in the middle, her color looks really wild. But people don't feel too off, but that's when uh, we'd go to a quick mask and get our brush tool. And let's make an adjustment layer just for her. And I 
I think also everything's, I pulled it in fairly desaturated. So that might've been a mistake, but mm -hmm. I wanted, I wanted to see these closer. I usually end up a little bit more desaturated, but I think that's part of what's causing this. So out of quick mask, and then I'm sure there's a way someone can tell me <laughs> when I leave quick mask, it always is highlighting everything else I didn't select, but I just invert it and then get my selection. So that seems like an extra step that's probably unnecessary that has an easy fix I don't know about. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, let, let us know in the chat if you know. Um, I, I don't know if I've done that. I usually won't merge everything together. I'll do my color grading like on each individual layer. Yeah. So this feels better, just giving her a little bit more saturation. Um, obviously, I don't want to see it in this obnoxious bag, which I'd probably end up cloning out anyway. So let's just erase that away. She looks less. Uh, I guess I can. Yeah, I would do that. I wouldn't do it on each individual layer, but I would do it with all the layers still in there. And I would leave these on top of all the layers so that they, if I want to use this same adjustment I did to her for over here, because they were on different layers, I would still want to take that and do it to her really quick. But mm. um, yeah, it's probably, it gets confusing then like where you've done what to which layers. And sometimes I will do them selectively to certain layers. So then I have a combination of like an overall hue saturation and then an individual hue saturation for that particular layer. Um, but again, I think that's just everyone's preference on that. But so let's say that's uh, girls saturation. And then I want to do one more for the overall image. It just feels dead. A little bit better. Like that. So yeah, this is really roughly I don't think even if I spent another 10 hours on this image, it would look too much different than this. Um, but obviously, you know, our trees are bright here and they, they go dark up here. So that's something I'd fine tune in a very painstaking way that I'm not <laughs> going to demonstrate. Um, but let's just get us a little bit closer. Take some of that curves bump out of the sky so we can see some more detail there. And yeah, the way that this is kind of leaving this dark edge on the roof, that would be something I'm going in and now masking out the roof very uh, cleanly on its edges so that it has a more even tone and it's not like having this weird gradient or um, maybe take a little bit less away from the roof, so make this closer to that. Maybe the house is too bright anyways. Let's just take that down closer to the sky. At least get us something more matchy so we can get a rough idea of a final. But yeah. This one's probably not going to end up in the books as I'm looking at it, which is why I shot this like a year ago and I haven't <laughs> worked on it till now. <laughs> it, it comes in handy for the, the demonstration, but I can see why I put it off. It was a fun experiment. Again, mm. the times I have shot with natural light, it's usually like sunset, very direct, kind of harder light. So I did want to kind of challenge myself and, and see how I can work with this open shade. Um, but I don't think ultimately it's something I like. Who knows? Yeah, I always have photos like that that I put off editing for so long. Right? And they just sit and die. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. You know? you know, not everything. I think that's a really good learning experience is that it feels like in the beginning, 
things work a lot better only because they're new to you. But as you do them for many, many years, uh, you like less and less of the work, I think, or you just become pickier because you see what standards you want to hold yourself to. And so yes, I used to kind of share and uh, put everything in my book and print it for my port my physical portfolio and put it on all social media. Like no matter what, if I put this much energy into an image, I'm like, I'm going to show it. But it's a nice thing to get to a point where you can just throw things away and say, not everyone needs to see that and just move on to making something new. But um, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and letting yourself try something without thinking that it has to go on social media or be shared, because I think um, when we have that in the back of our minds, it limits limits our creativity because we're kind of holding back from something that we may want to experiment with or try because we don't want people to think poorly of us if it doesn't come out perfect you know yeah yeah i know it's a, it's a tough thing to guess and i mean sometimes that's a nice thing about putting it out there and seeing kind of what reaction because you can always take it down um it's it's almost like a nice testing ground the way a comic will go to different clubs and try material and yeah kind of so true gauge the crowd reaction you know they're seeing that in real time and seeing what works and what doesn't just by hearing laughs and like i don't like to put too much stock into likes and comments but sometimes they can be interesting indicators of what that feels like because you know your viewers typically have a good sense of what they're used to seeing from you and so if it's maybe too far from what you've done in the past uh, maybe it's good to, with especially with a new image, kind of get that tester out there and then say, you know what, I had a hunch this wasn't working. This kind of feels like proof. Yeah. And, and there you go. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, who knows where that's going to end up in 10 years because I think there's a, a good, for good reason, uh, like a backlash against, you know, you can now set your photos to not have comments and likes and Right. I think there's a lot of healthy reasons to who just kind of trust your own gut and and not bother with looking at those stats. But yeah. Yeah. And so for you, are you um, what's your main platform? Is it Instagram? Or are you sharing a lot uh, of elsewhere? Um, yeah, it is still Instagram, even though I know within the last couple of years, there's been a huge kind of push away from that, which to me, I really don't care. I, I'm tired of jumping from platform to platform. I'd, I'd rather have somewhere that we can just stay and have our portfolio up. Yep. Um, you know, I'd go back to Flickr and this is probably something <laughs> I don't think most of the users here, the viewers here have ever even used because it's so old, but it's still to me the the way that they built their desktop version, especially they kind of fell behind on the uh, app, but that the desktop version is like the best way to look at images and it's like the way comments are set up you can just put bigger files and it's full yeah. screen um yeah. i don't think there's a there's a great platform you know instagram isn't great for viewing images that way it's good for because that's where everyone uses and so you get a lot more attention there but um i don't mind if everyone abandons it as long as we have an alternative that uh, shows the images better. So I completely me, agree with you. Well, can we start a Flickr revolution or what? I you... know ev everyone <laughs> in the chat is like, Oh, good old Flickr. Oliver yeah. said, I still use it. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I think Behance is maybe going in that direction of kind of offering, um, a platform where we can show our work in higher scale and show all the details of it and everything. But yeah. I, I do agree with you that uh, like I, Instagram still where I share my work because that's where most of my audience is. And also yeah. I think that I hope that they will continue to evolve in the right direction. And maybe this is just a blip in the road because we need some platform that everyone's going to be on. You can't just go to your own platform and start sharing things with the hope that it will blow up. And I think Instagram is still that place right now, regardless of what's been going on. Yeah. Know? Well, that's a good point about Behance because they do get a lot of traffic. I see because I, I often do forget, you know, I, I put projects up there and it seems very useful for having whole series in a specific place. And 
I'm sure there's a way, again, that a more experienced user knows to kind of curate my page so that it feels more like, uh, I guess, closer to what my website is. I know that they have a portfolio thing on there now, right? Yeah, so yeah. Maybe they're yeah, already I'm fixing it. I don't know. And I need to go back and like redo my Behance profile. I know. I need to spend some time working on mine too. It's a big mess right now, but I, I have a couple of friends who mostly just share on Behance uh, a little on Instagram, but they get all of their work from on there. Like clients yeah. will find them. And I think that's really cool because it's a, a really good uh, networking platform for all of us as well. Yeah. I've noticed that a lot of art directors and creative directors um, who work at ad agencies have pages up there. So yeah. they're typically the ones who are making the final decision on hiring you for ad jobs. So it seems just intuitive that that's where we should be spending more time. If we were looking at more commercial work, um, I just yeah. always, <laughs> there's just so many things to upload to. I just need to remember. I you know. know. I know, I feel you. Um, uh, well, so, so we have about 25 minutes left and this looks like an <laughs> amazing photo. So I'll let you uh, dive back into this. Yeah, uh, this one's another weird one that I shot about a year ago and have been sitting on. Uh, the compositing's already done. I had had a retoucher, well, I should say a retouching agency reach out to me and offer to kind of trade for some, you know, they said they wanted to work on a personal project of mine and then, uh, you know, keep me in mind for future paid gigs. And so I thought that was a good deal because the compositing is very painstaking on some of these and I don't like doing it. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll have them take a crack at this. Uh, and they did an amazing job. Like the composite is pretty seamless for me. The only thing that stops me from putting it out there, well, one is the concept. <laughs> it's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty out there like uh we this is a group of people who are all for the most part photographers we've been meeting up together uh since 2009 uh, it's called food camp and oh yeah i saw this on your website yeah so that first image i showed with the pool was all food campers and this is kind of i mean officially food camp ended a few years ago but we have informal meetups with you know, smaller versions of it because it was up to like 30, 40 people at one point. And so this is just like a smaller group of us meeting in Kansas last year. And it was near uh, coming of fall. And so it made me think of Wicker Man. I don't know if anyone's seen that movie, not the Nick Cage version, but there's an old like 80s version. Uh, it might be even late 70s. Anyways, we kind of did this homage to this weird movie, old horror movie, and it's not a Burning Man reference as uh, Paco brought up, but <laughs> now looking at it, I'm like, there's no way I can escape that. So like, I don't want to be associated with Burning Man, nothing against it. I just never went. So I'm not going to like pretend that I have any uh, association with it, but how can I show this? And people aren't going to say, oh, does that have to do with Burning Man? So like, yeah. I don't know. I may never, this may be another one that just sits in the vault, but at least I have, um, you know, we put a lot of effort into it. Our friend Garrett here, uh, who's in the orange coat, did wardrobe for everyone. So that was, uh, I appreciate his efforts and it looks great. Um, I do want to release it for the sake of everyone, you know, helping me out and making this image and, you know, supporting the effort. But yeah, it just leaves me a little uneasy. I'm, I'm curious about anyone else's thoughts. Uh, I know it's, it's funny. We got like a couple, yeah, Burning Man things in here. <laughs> um, somewhere back, let's see. Like, uh -huh. obviously it's referring to these people are in some sort of cults, maybe adjacent, not quite, but like, I don't want to get into a religious conversation with anyone about this. <laughs> <laughs> we we're really just having fun and we aren't, uh, you know, Satan worshipers. So uh, it's, I like it. It, it was really <laughs> it reminds me of um, the movie. Uh, oh, my God. Why am I blanking on the title right now? 
Um, I'm going to have to think of the title, but uh, they all go into the woods. It's like these backpackers go into the woods and then they start having these weird experiences. And at the end, they come upon. Oh, Blair Witch. No, um, (laughs) I don't know why I'm blanking on the name, but they at the end, they come across this uh, like cult burning just like this, where it's all these people like around a. Um, the name will come to me. I'm having like a senior moment. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Well, you know, the one thing um, that has also stopped me from doing this is I think a bit of the colors just need more of a collective cohesion. And so I thought I could bring this in for now and, and try and show how I've done that in the past. Um, I don't know how well, so it doesn't always work really well. And but again, I think people know how to do it better than I do. Uh, but what I would typically do is just select a shirt or an item of clothing and then uh, use a various different tools to change the color. But um, I thought I'd give that a whirl because that was kind of, we're close here, you know? There, there's like, there's just a few things standing out to me that I think stop me and it's probably the first is going to be this like tangerine skirt um so typically what i would do is again do a rough selection let's get in a little closer i know you can just replace color and and grab it with um a color picking tool, but my experience in the past is that, especially if there's any gradient of light on the objects, uh, you have troubles with that. This is pretty uniform and different from any other color in the frame, so it probably would work, but I'm just gonna do it this way for now. Um, so once we have the selection, let's try Try to replace color and my dialog box is going down here. All right, so the fuzziness is going to decide how much of that color you're grabbing and you want to get it, find that balance between, because you can see it's already starting to grab parts of the hay bale as well, but just start in the middle there to see what's going on. Okay, so if I wanna go in the direction, oh, I should have done this on a new layer. Hold on. Let's do that. Oh no, that doesn't work because then I can't hide away. Forget what I had done in the past for that. I guess because they would typically be on a separate. Sorry, I'm having a a moment myself. (laughs) I want to mask this with a new layer, but. Hold on. Do it like, th- oh yeah, do it like this and then I can hide that all away. Okay. It was another one of those things that I have done many times, but I don't do necessarily all the time. So I know. it feels like somewhat learning over again. I, I really, I, it's never that clean for me and so I try to avoid it as much as possible but in this image I think it might be the one thing that allows me to feel comfortable enough with it to uh, actually show people Mm. so oh why is it not changing now huh excuse me weird um huh i am not sure (laughs) 
Okay. Well, I'll figure out the solution to that later, but for now, let's just change it on the flatten layer. It's the other point of trying to do things not in the slow, deliberate pace that you normally would work. That's Okay. Huh, something really changed. Oh, is it because of this? No. Yeah, I wonder why it's not working. Let's see if it was that. Um. Oh, did I not do that? I don't think I selected the color. There we go. Ah. Yeah, see, normally I would have this on a separate layer so I can go back and tweak it later. Let's just get it close to where I think I want to end up. So replace color is a good starting point. And again, if you have a solid clean color, usually it's pretty uh, malleable to, to change the whole thing evenly. Um, and just see how that works with kind of the overall image, but you know, with color, I'm usually usually using a blend of, of a bunch of different tools. So like his shirt's close, but I don't necessarily want to change the whole color of it. I just maybe want to make it a little less saturated. So again, quick selection. Here's where color theory class would come in handy as yes. well, just to know like what sense am i going to make of this overall image like you can just kind of go item by item and change them kind of willy-nilly or if you know color theory you can say like why this orange or this pumpkin doesn't want to be in this image at all or maybe it does and maybe it's the yellow of her dress that's wrong um but generally I'll just kind of go by my gut and see what feels right before worrying about all that. Oh, that's that the big difference, you know, with hue saturation, which is, you know, a great way if you wanted to actually hardcore just change the color, the colorize. Uh, button within here is good for that instead of replace color but if you had them all if I had already like made a separate layer just for her then I could do the replace color and then adjust that accordingly but I like how the adjustment layer automatically makes this here so I can go back and edit it yeah I, w I wonder if there's a way to do that with replace color that I'm not figuring um. out yeah, with replace color, it might need to be if it's a smart object, if mm. you were to make a new layer mm. for that particular part of the outfit, mm -hmm. make it a smart object and then change the color, it should keep it non-destructible. It's always hard, like thinking in my head, going through yeah. the, the motions of it. Yeah, this makes more sense to me. So we have about 10 minutes left. If anybody has any questions for Ryan as he's finishing up here or um, anything else you want to share in the chat, let us know. Not 
this guy too. I feel like another thing I didn't do get to on the other image, but I almost always be doing selective uh, exposures on everyone to kind of even out things. Um, you know, I don't want him to look fake, but he is lit enough there to kind of open him up so we can see him more. Yeah. Um, everyone else it looks like mostly, you know, the retouchers when they did this composite probably did a little bit of that because um, they look fairly even to me now. I think it's the fire mostly that besides the just the nature of the fact that there's a burning man of sticks, <laughs> uh, it's so much clearer. It's almost like they're, they've added grain to the rest of the image and not to the fire bit. Mm. Which seems odd to me. So maybe there I would want to um, add grain just to the fire to make that match a little bit more. Because it looks, I mean, it's definitely probably the thing that's most in focus as well. But again, with this image, I think most everything besides the deep background, like all the medium ground people are going to be about the same in focus yeah um yeah i wonder was the fire composited in or oh yeah so i should have talked about that the fire we did it's real like the man is real we all these flames are real plates but they just combined different portions of it so that it was more evenly lit ah it, okay the wood was a little bit wet, so it didn't burn perfect like this. So we just kind of added lighter fluid to certain sections of it and lit it at separate times. But again, I think it, to me, it looks pretty real because it is like the light from this flame is really lighting each of these people's faces. Mm. Um, so that's another thing where even though this image is a little bit more fantastic than I would normally go because we shot it all on camera, it feels somewhat more realistic. Even the sky here is not dropped in. Like this is a real sky from a plate that was shot over the course of the time as the light changed. Cool. And again, that's really important for me. Like all the light is from strobe. I mean, there is a little bit of an ambient fill, but you can see the definition of each of the subjects is so great compared to the last image we showed because of that strobe kind of hard edge it's giving and, and kind of defining everyone's features. So yeah. now that I have this selected, I'm gonna duplicate it and let's add some grain to uh, just, and my dialogue box keeps coming up here, but. Um, Fairy was wondering if you used a flash to light the models in this one. Yeah, so um, we have our biggest source is to camera left here. You see it's a little bit brighter on the ground down here. Mm -hmm. And it's just a large umbrella about right here. And it's pretty much lighting the sides of all these people. So and the front and the sides, but then giving a little fill to these people as well. But then to camera right, we have a similar size umbrella just on a little bit less power so that we have more shape coming from the left because our backlight's also coming from the left. So what we have is the three strobes doing the main lighting for all of our subjects. One camera left, one hard one coming from back behind the shed here, which is why you can see it gets really bright here and it's backlighting the fog. There's also a fog machine that's adding to that. Wow. Um, and then this other fill from the right here, which, you know, this was another one kind of done down and dirty because it's not, I don't have a bunch of assistance and uh, a rental house nearby. We're in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. I drove up to this meeting kind of just with, you know, the thought in mind, I'm going to take a picture of my friends and it's not a, a real important thing I need to spend thousands of dollars on. So I'm kind of using what I have at my disposal. Um, but the edge light back here is a hard light. Um, and there's another separate edge on our guy in the boat back here. Mm. So it's a fourth image just hitting him. And then there's kind of a general fill that's like just the dusk sky that is filling in the shadows everywhere. 
Wow. So, and then the fire is a significant source. Like if all yeah. the strobes and sometimes the strobes didn't fire and you could still see people. So the flame was actually lighting up these people quite a bit, which again, I think adds to the realism of the image. Very cool. Um, Barry also asked, what modifiers did you use for your strobes? Yeah, so this one, again, it's just like, uh, I think there's a large Fotec, which is about a three to four foot size umbrella, which has uh, a white sock over the front of it for added diffusion. So mm. the, the light is shooting into the umbrella and be creating an indirect source, which is, creates softer shadows. Then you add the, the sock on top of the umbrella, which diffuses it even more. Um, and I think I have one of those on each side. There is a possibility that one of the umbrellas was bare and didn't have a sock. I don't really remember, but the backlights don't have modifiers on them. They're just the bare heads with a hard light coming through, which is why you can see this hard shadow right here, because this is just a bare uh, Dynalite head. Oh, okay. And another bare head on him. Um, but typically if I were given, <laughs> you know, full crew and budget to do this. We would use much larger sources uh, that had much more diffusion to soften the shadows and to create a more realistic atmosphere that would say it was created by the fire. Uh, sometimes when I've added fire in the past, we've also added a strobe right in the fire uh, or behind it. So that it's, oh, it's, wow. it's increasing the illumination that the source is coming from all sides the way a fire would. It's just stronger so that you don't have to drag and use a very long shutter speed to get the fire to be the exposure you need because then uh, the people would be blurry because it'd be hard for them to hold still. So there's yeah. a lot of factors going into the technical aspect of making this exposure match the sky at this time and to balance the fire exposure with the strobes. Mm, so interesting. Um, and Ferry wants to know what brand are your strobes? So this is a mix of Profoto and Dynalite. Um, okay. Again, because these are just old things that I own and use for personal projects. Uh, when I rent stuff, I would typically rent Profoto. Again, just much newer versions. Cool. Uh, but also use Ellen Chrome or Bron Color, depending on the rental house. I was just up in Portland and... We used all bronze color for that. And, you know, they each have their different advantages. Uh, I would say ultimately it's less important to worry about the brands, but some get really expensive. So that's a huge consideration. Uh, I think these old dining lights you won't see in rental houses anymore, but uh, in a pinch, they work really good. And they, they may be 30 years old, some, some of them, but they work yeah. great. So. It's more about how you use them than uh, what they are. Unless, again, there's very specific technical reasons to use newer strobes that have faster flash durations if you want to freeze action, especially if you're battling against the sun and you need high-speed sync. That's a whole other technical conversation we can get into, but uh, it's quite in-depth. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, we <laughs> are just about out of time here. This has been super interesting and and really cool to see your process um just want to make sure we got everything from the chat here yeah um cool well thank you so much ryan for joining us today and thank just you this is a ton of fun yeah of course uh just want to remind everyone to stick around for the etsy small business boot camp coming up with katrina and jordan learn how to schedule your social media in adobe express following the boot camp join our brand designer adam greasley on adobe live as he creates a brand design for a bot botanical themed gin company thank you so much everyone for watching and we will see you all soon have a great rest of your day bye thank you